Oh, I want to stay in the shade, definitely. It's sunny today. All right, everyone. So if you're just joining us, we're at San Alejo, or excuse me, we're at Cardiff State Beach, and I'm Sandy, an interpreter with California State Parks. And we're here with Miss Elena from the Nature Collaborative, and she is co-hosting this program called Who Digs the Dunes? And we know that people will come in a little bit later, and that's okay. Uh, we're fine with that. Just come in when you can and join us. Um, but we're going to wait just for about one minute. And we'll start right at 11. But while we're waiting, I'm going to just give you a chance to take a look at the ocean. You can see there's quite a few people here today. It's busy. It's probably about 65 degrees right now, but it's supposed to go up to about, I think, 78 or maybe 80 today. Um, the tide, the low tide was early this morning so the tide is now coming in and we're going to be talking about the tides a little bit later as well so we'll give our friends just about 30 seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started you have a, a minute we're going to do an activity later where you could use a hair tie or a rubber band so if you want to grab one and have it ready then you can participate in that activity later so a hair tie or a rubber band All right, well, we're going to turn it over to Miss Elena to get us started because it's just 11.01. We're all right on time. Hey, everybody. Welcome. My name is Elena Flanders, and I am the volunteer director at Nature Collective, formerly known as the San Alejo Lagoon Conservancy. So you may have heard of us from that name before. And we believe that if we help people discover a passion for nature, that they will want to protect it and value everything that it has to offer. I'll go ahead and Send it right back over to Sandy, interpreter Sandy. Um, take it away, Sandy. All right. So want to welcome you again to this home learning program on ports. And the name of our program is Who Digs the Dunes? And you know what? We hope that by the end of the program today that you do. I don't mean literally because this area is protected. But we do hope that by the end of the program, you're going to feel connected to the rare but harsh dunes habitat or the sand dunes. And you can see a gorgeous sand dunes. And those beach primrose are coming up a little bit more flowers than we had a month ago after that big rain. And you can see there's a boundary around it. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that and keeping those dunes protected. So this area, besides having the sand dune habitat, is also home to this marine or ocean ecosystem and the sandy shore. And you know what? Um, there is also something called a state marine conservation area, which is, part, which is a type of marine protected area or MPA. And a marine protected area helps to manage what kind of activities go on and it also helps to restrict things that could be taken. So Miss Elena is going to show a, a slide of the outline of this particular state marine conservation area called Swamis. And if you are familiar with this area, by the way, we're in Northern San Diego County and we have about three and a half, a little over three miles of coastline and then you can see that the protection extends more than three miles or three nautical miles out to sea. And that's, that's this area that is protected. And I wanna say one more thing about the marine protected areas. They are so important, especially, well, for our oceans, of course, but especially for our dunes habitat because they are so rare. So I have a question for you. I'm going to show you something here. 
I think you're going to know what it is. Oh, my participants, I was going to ask you to raise your hand as long as you can see me and hear me. So my participants, will you uh, raise your hand and show me you're here? Oh, all right, Caitlin, thank you for raising your hand. Oh, we've got some more. Oh, several of you are tuning in. We love that. Awesome. So I have a question for you all. The sand here, our sand, can you tell me if you think it's part of the marine protected area? Raise your hand if you think it is. All right, some of you do. Okay, all right. Not, I don't think everyone, but some of you definitely. And you know, you would think it would be, and, and I even thought it was, but you know what? Our state marine conservation area or the, or the MPA, it's part of the big umbrella called the MPA. It extends to the high tide mark along the coast right here. But you know what? The benefits of the protection in Swamis extends to our dunes area. And the dunes is protected by California state parks. So we're gonna talk about more uh, about this rare habitat. And speaking of the dunes, Miss Elena is going to tell us how these dunes are formed in nature. Sure, so let's, let's actually take a quick look at how the special dune habitat forms by watching a short video. to make a dune. The first recipe is a classic, friends. All you'll need is sand, water, wind, and a dash of beach grass. Start with the regular beach and add a little wind. The faster gusts will pick up grains of sand and start to pile them up. Now throw in the beach grass. It will slow the wind so it drops its sand. Dunes will begin to form and the grass will keep growing, creating a mesh that helps prevent erosion. Salty waves will kill the grass closest to the water, so you'll have a stretch of empty beach and, where the grass survives, a line of dunes. That empty beach is important, though. It supplies sand and maintains the dune. The wider the beach, the bigger they will become, and the better they can protect the land beyond them. Every now and then, as sea levels rise, a major storm will flatten the dunes and push the entire beach inland. But don't worry, the dune will grow back in a dozen years or so. But hold on, what if there are buildings where these new dunes want to grow? What if you want the dunes back where they can protect those buildings? Well, friends, try the second recipe, the one used by... The dunes that you see at Cardiff State Beach, they actually were not formed actually. They were restored two years ago in 2018 and 2019. So you might remember there were some large tractors all on the beach. And you might have been wondering what was happening. Well, this project is also known as the Cardiff Living Shoreline. And it's a project with the Coast California State Coastal Conservancy, City of Encinitas, California State Parks, and Nature Collective. So wow, that's a ton of partners working together to restore this awesome dune habitat. So before all of this, the highway was protected by big piles of rocks and the huge rocks made it really hard for visitors to get down to the beach. They have to crawl over these big piles of rocks. And in addition, some smaller pieces of rocks would actually get tossed onto the roadway. So there's a Highway 101 that passes right by where these big rocks were and that actually hit the cars driving by. So the living shoreline still has these large rocks or riprap. So you can look at that drawing picture on the slide, but the rocks have actually been dropped underneath the sand dunes. And the rocks were then covered with sand that was reused from the San Alejo Lagoon Restoration Project. So sand was excavated or it was taken out of the lagoon in order to deepen and widen the channel so that more water could get into the lagoon. And the sand that was taken was used to create these dunes, which is pretty cool. Sandy, can you um, show us again how uh, far the dunes actually stretch? Wow. So the the dunes are basically going to stretch a total of three miles all the way up to Moonlight Beach and then all the way down the shore, or, or excuse me, the MPA does. But the, the 
dunes here extends about a mile. And you can see the orange building maybe way down there. It's not quite that far. So it's about three quarters of a mile to a mile down. And Sandy, did you have a, you had a bucket there? Oh, I do. Let's take a look at that. Yep, I will get right back to my bucket. So I have a question for you. I actually have a couple questions, but this one involves a bucket. So we have a two gallon bucket here. I'm gonna ask you to put your science thinking caps on and I want you to guess our whole restoration project, remember it was three and three fourths of a mile to a mile down. How many buckets do you think it took during the restoration to completely restore this living shoreline project? How many buckets? So raise your hand if you think it took more than a thousand buckets. Oh, I think everybody thinks it took more than a thousand buckets. How many of you think it took 10,000 buckets at least? Oh, people are still raising their hands. A hundred thousand buckets. Whoa, that's a lot, right? But it took literally 300,000 buckets. Or excuse me, more than that, 3 million buckets. 3 million buckets it took to restore the dunes. Unbelievable. What a project. That's so awesome. Thank you for sharing that tidbit with us, Sandy. So another goal uh, of the project was to restore the habitat, for the plants, and the animals that live there. So how did we do that? Well, volunteers, they spent countless hours planting indigenous plants and also spreading around some seeds. The scientists collected the seeds, but they were so tiny that they had to mix them with sand before they spread them all over. So take a look. I don't know if you can even see it, but that teeny tiny dot next to the penny, that black dot is a tiny seed from our beach primrose. And so scientists actually went out in the field and collected these seeds and they terminated them or they grew them in our nursery until the plants were big enough and ready to replant. Um, and that was because of the beach primrose, it's one of our few beautiful strands of living in the dune. It's really hard to live out here, but they adapted to live in this very hot and sunny environment. But before I share with you a couple of very unique I want you to make some observations of your phone. Take a look at the picture. So scientists in the field, they have these excellent observation skills. And to make observations, you really want to use all of your senses. But virtually, you can only use your sense of sight. So that's okay. So just say out loud at your home right now some things that you notice. So I noticed, I noticed there's some yellow flowers. I noticed it looks like they're growing low to the ground. You may notice some different things and that's super cool. One cool thing about this plant is if you look at the leaf, this is under a microscope, but if you look at them up close, you'll still notice that there's a lot of tiny hairs all over the plant. And if you check out your arm, you'll notice that there's tiny hairs all over your arm too. And that's actually to protect you and to protect these plants from the hot summer sun, which is super, super cool. And another awesome adaptation that helps the plant survive is a very deep root called a taproot. And the taproot goes deep into the ground and helps the plant survive by not only holding on to the sand, but also keeping the sand held together. So what I want you to do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a, a little activity that we can do together. So I want you, I want you to pretend that your left hand is your root and your right hand is your sand dune and go ahead and take your root or the fibrous root system and stick it into the sand dune and try and pull it out. It's pretty easy to pull those roots out, but then we talked about the beach primrose. It has a super long taproot. So just take one finger, that's your super long taproot and go ahead and stick it into your sand dune and now try and pull the root out. It's way harder to do. So that's the super cool adaptation of the beach primrose. Let's see, let's, let's tune in with um, Sandy. Can you show us some of the beach primrose and maybe share some cool facts about it? 
I sure can. Awesome. Sorry, there we go. Oh, and it is blooming so much more since we had a storm a while back and we've got a lot of flowers here. And I don't know if you could see our honeybee, but she is pollinating. And you know what? The bees are so important. We really are happy when they're here. There they are. You can see this plant is low to the ground, just like Miss Selena was talking about. They are protecting themselves from the heat and the extreme drought that sometimes occurs. And again, it's a harsh climate. They're beautiful. This is called an indigenous plant because it belongs here. It's been here for thousands of years. And humans did not plant this originally. It grew here on its own. Guys, I think I got off track. We lost, we lost your video. I, I know, there we go. That's okay. I can share a picture of the, were you gonna share with us some info about the sea rocket? Hold on one second, let me get back to you guys. Okay. Oh, here we go. I was going to talk about the sea rocket. I can, yeah, let me just get back over to the sea rocket. We have a huge amount here and you can see how it's mixed in with the beach primrose. Oh, by the way, the beach primrose has a lot of different names. The yellow one I showed you, you can see a little bit of it right here. And that was called the shrubby beach primrose, the evening, the beach evening primrose. It comes by a couple of different names. But do you see this purple plant that's kind of intermixed with beach primrose. This is called the sea rocket. And I'm going to get a close up for you. The sea rocket is invasive. That means it does not belong. And it is choking out literally this section of the indigenous plant. And that's what invasives do. They compete with our indigenous plants, which are native plants. They compete with them by taking sunlight, water, space, nutrients, all of those things from the native plants or the, excuse me, the indigenous plants. And so that's why we don't like this. In fact, you might even see volunteers at some point from the Nature Collective or even state parks out here. And they are taking out this, the, uh, the sea rocket because it is invasive. All right. I went ahead and put a picture up on the screen so you can get a close-up look at the flower um, and some more of the sea rocket growing along the hillside. So I wanted to say one more thing um, about the dunes before we move on. Just that th this area has many different types of plants in it and it was designed that way. Miss Elena, did you talk about the different species, uh, the, how many different types of species or that you were all planting many different types of species in this restoration? Um, no, but yes, there are lots of different plants. So if you get a chance, you should head down to the Cardiff State Beach and walk along and check out the green habitat and see how many different plants that you can find in there. And biodiversity is always a goal in the MPA as well as here at our protected dunes area. And speaking of that, we would like to talk about some of the creatures that benefit from this dunes habitat. And one of them is a special friend here called a killdeer. And a killdeer, although you wouldn't necessarily think of it as a regular at the uh, dunes, I've seen one here and I even saw one nesting. And they have a really interesting way of getting your attention. Now, I'm gonna ask you to help me with this. So I would like you to actually stand up if you have the room. If you don't have the room, it's okay to stay seated, but I want you to act out how the killdeer mom, how she will steer 
a predator away from her nest. And I was walking along the border here, which is a boundary, and I heard this squawk, 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 definitely <laughs> getting my attention. And she was waving her wings like this. And she was definitely wanting me to look at her and not focus on her chicks. So I want you to do the same thing. I want you to be waving your hands, just like the mama killed there. Now, the other thing that she does, again, to get predators attention on her, and she will lead them away from her nest and her chicks, is she'll drop her shoulder. It's like she has a broken wing and she will kind of drag it along. That's what I'd like you to do. You don't have to go anywhere, but just drag that shoulder and act like you've got like an injured shoulder. And that's what they do again, because a predator might think, oh, there's an easy lunch and they'll swoop down and, and try to get her, but she's going to get away from them and keep her chicks safe. Miss Elena, I think you were gonna share about your favorite animal from the beautiful sand dunes. I would love to share my favorite animal. So my favorite animal is a reptile that's found at the dunes and it's a legless lizard. I'll play this little video you can watch. So it is a lizard and it's often confused with a snake because it has no leg, but you can tell it's a lizard because when it blinks, uh, snakes actually do not blink. So that's the way that you can tell the difference between a leg, uh, a lizard, and a snake. And so this, the, this um, in the video, this actually is not the silverly legless lizard. But the silverly legless lizard, can you say that three times? Silverly legless lizard. <laughs> silverly legless. legless lizard. Silverly legless lizard. Okay, that's really hard. Prefers cooler temperatures and doesn't bask in the sun like a lot of the common lizards that you would find, like the western fence lizard or the alligator lizard that you might see in your yards. So it burrows in the loose soil or the sand that's at the beach, and it feeds on larval insects, beetles, termites, and spiders. Sandy, did you want to do a little activity so we can try and help us remember whether it's a snake or a lizard? I absolutely do. So I'm going to bring it back here to me. We, we are going to pretend. It's kind, kind of a challenge, actually. Listening skills. It's a little bit like Simon says. So we're thinking about being a lizard. If I say lizard, I want you to blink your eyes closed like that. That's a lizard because a lizard can blink, but the snake can't blink. So when I say snake, I want those eyes open wide and no blinking allowed. All right, ready? Lizard, snake, lizard, snake. Oh, did I catch you on that one? Try it again. Snake, lizard, there you go. Just a fun way to remember the difference between the legless lizards, lizards and snakes, kind of fun. And thank you for sharing that really special creature, Miss Elena. So we have another creature to share with you. I think this is one of our favorites and she is called, or he is called the snowy clover. And in this case, it's the Western snowy clover. This is a threatened species. That means the numbers are low enough that it is a concern of the uh, California Department of Wildlife and so forth that they are watching their numbers because again, their numbers are not robust. Now, that's one of the reasons why this habitat, the living shoreline was restored and that's to help protect the, a nesting area that they're hopeful soon we will have nesting pairs again here like we do at some of the other places in uh, our swamp our, our swami's mpa area but uh, our snowy plover is so important it it will it, and it, oh there's the chicks they are so cute um, the, the protection comes really from humans we have to help them they barely make a real nest or what we would call like a deep nest. In the sand, it's almost just, we call it a scrape. It's almost just like you took your hand and scraped a little bit of sand out. They might use things from the beach like little pieces of shell. That's why we don't collect the shells here at the shore at the Cardiff. And this is why feathers and things that they might use, even seaweed to kind of disguise their nest 
that's why we leave those things on the shore. But the other reason we have that boundary set up with the wooden posts and the rope, that's to keep things like predators out, like our dogs. You don't realize it, but dogs can be our predators. And so the snowy plover would be very unlikely to nest in a place where they thought they were predators. So the, the, our snowy plover, uh, I want you to do one more activity with me and that's to put your hands together like this. And I want you to imagine a mother snowy plover or a father, an adult plover sitting in the palms of your hand. That's how big they are. And they look a lot like other birds here called sanderlings. But look at that short little dark beak. That's uh, the plover. And then the plover also has a very interesting parenting style. The mother will lay a clutch of eggs and she will stay there until the eggs hatch. But within three hours, those uh, chicks are up and moving around and you can see how well camouflaged they are. And so um, the dad snowy plover actually takes over and helps taking care of the young until they grow where they can fledge on their own. And the mother goes off to have other uh, snowy plovers in the same season. And that's really important. You say, well, that sounds like a bad mother. She left her little ones, but no, she's going off to have more chicks because we need to get those numbers more healthy, raise those numbers up of the plovers. All right. Uh, we've talked about some uh, wildlife that benefit from the dunes, but can you think of some reasons that humans might want to rely on the dunes. So, oh, we're, yep, we're going to talk about the tides. So let's go back and talk about the tides with uh, Miss Elena. That's a good thought though. Keep that, keep that in your mind. How can you I will. from the dunes? I like that question, Andy. So if you were actually sure. to visit and look for the plovers, you could find them. Um, usually when it's low tide, they're foraging down like sort of along the lower edge of the beach. And when the tide comes up, they take shelter. So uh, when you when you visit Cardiff Beach, it can look very different depending on if it's low or if it's high tide. And here are some photos that were taken during a king tide event. So you'll notice the drastic difference when comparing the photos. And in case you hadn't heard of it, the term king tide it, it's describe the highest tides of the year. And king tides provide an opportunity for us to see a glimpse of what the coast might actually look like as sea level rises. So seeing what areas flood during these events can really help us plan for the future. And the dune habitat, they don't, they're not only important for endangered species, but they provide home to the dune. Uh, the dunes actually protect the road from the force of the ocean. So that's pretty cool. They actually absorb energy from storm waves during extreme high tide events. Here's another picture. So there's, see, there's no dunes in front of this parking lot in during a lot of the high tides, the water actually comes up into the parking lot. So tides are kind of complicated, but I'm gonna share an abbreviated explanation with you, which is that um, high and low tides are caused mostly by the moon and also by the sun. The moon's gravitational pull generates this thing called a tidal force. And the tidal force causes the earth and its water to bulge out on the side closest to the moon and also the side that's farthest from the moon, these bulges of water are the high tides. So as the earth rotates, the part of earth that you're on passes through both of these bulges each day. So when you're in one of the bulges, that's when you're experiencing the high tide. And when you're not in one of the bulges, that's when you experience the low tide. And the cycle of two high tides and two low tides occurs most days on most coastlines of the entire world. So go ahead and jump up right now and grab a hair tie or a rubber band if you have one. And let's check this out. Sandy, will you demonstrate for us? And I'll walk us all through. Um, let me spotlight you so everyone can see. Okay. Grab your hair tie and pretend that your hair tie or your rubber band represents all of the water on earth. Okay. And your right pointer finger is the earth. And if there was no moon and no sun, there would be no gravitational pull on the earth and there would be no tides. So your water or your hair tie would be evenly distributed all the way around the earth. The moon has the largest gravitational pull on earth which causes the moon to move around the earth and pull all of the water towards it. So pretend that your left pointer finger is the moon and have it pull all the water on earth. So you'll notice that the side 
of the earth that's closest to the moon now has the most water. What you, what you won't see in this demonstration is also on the opposite side would have some water. But this causes the high tide in this area. So as the moon rotates around the earth, different sides of the earth have more or less water depending which side is closest to the moon. So as I mentioned before, there are a lot of other factors like the earth is spinning and also the sun has a small gravitational pull. But this is just a quick visual to help you understand the tides. And down there at Cardiff, the average high tide is about two to three feet. But what if that doubled or what if it tripled? How would that affect the dunes and the surrounding area? So that's what we need to think about. And as I just mentioned, the dunes do, they help protect the coast highway from flooding and road erosion, which are two very important things that the dunes provide for humans. So benefits to humans. So let's, let's check back with Sandy and learn how you could be an ambassador when you're visiting the dunes at Cardiff Beach. So we, we were just talking about the tides and how there are these new, now king tides are natural. That's occurred for, forever as long as recorded history and way, way back before we were here. But remember the water level, the sea level is rising as a result of climate change. And that's what's making the difference where we have more flooding and more chances of flooding. And that's why, and this, well, I'm gonna get back to the question that I was asking you before we dove into the tides. And that is, can you think of why humans want to preserve, other than our beautiful animals and creatures, why humans want to preserve our, uh, our uh, sorry, the dunes, why they want to preserve the dunes. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. So why would humans want to? We know the animals rely on it and they receive benefits from it, but what's in it for the humans? As Miss Elena just said, and I'm think about that for just a second, why are humans wanting to keep the dunes and make sure that they are protected and restored? And if you, I'm going to name a couple of reasons. And if you agree with any of the reasons that I say, go ahead and raise your hand. So I, I know that you're in agreement. One of the things I thought of is one of the things that Miss Elena was talking about, including flooding, flooding of the highway, flooding of the parking lots, and maybe businesses and things along the, the uh, coastline that humans have made. And even their homes, a lot of people live very close to the water. And so if that sea level is rising because those polar ice caps are melting, sea levels rising, and those extreme storms that we have also as a result of climate change, they're bringing higher sea level and more chance of flooding. And the dunes are nature's, nature's help, almost like a dam to, to block or buffer the sea and keep the ocean where it should be. And so that's why humans want that protection from their flooding on the highway and the parking lots and so forth. And that's why we as humans wanna protect the dunes as well as for the other reasons that we talked about today. You know what, there's things we can do to help combat climate change and the sea level rise that results. And one of them is to reduce the amount of energy that we use. And another way is to join a group, maybe an environmental club at your school, or maybe you even start an environmental club at your school. And maybe it's an organization that you work with, like a soccer team, and you get together and you work on ways to help us solve climate change. You know, teamwork, teamwork makes the dream work. And the more of us that are involved collectively working for climate change, we can solve this, right? I love that. Well, uh, I have one more question. I was going to ask Miss Elena if she would show one of the ways that you can be a good steward besides those group activities, just you as an individual, when you and your family come to visit us at Cardiff, at uh, Swami's MPA here. Uh, and I want you to take a look at this slide. It was taken right here at Swami's. And I want you to tell me, do you see anybody being a good steward of the dunes in this picture. And if you do, go ahead and raise your hand.
oh, I'm just seeing a couple of hands raised. You may or may not see it. There's actually someone walking a dog, but you'll see that they are outside of the boundary and they are closer to the water. Remember dogs are, are predators and so are snowy plovers and our legless lizards. They would be afraid if they came too close. And that's why we have that border around our beautiful sand dunes. But that's one way you can be a good steward. Tell your family and friends, hey, we keep our dogs away from the sand dunes and we don't wanna cross the border and, and walk on the sand dunes and trample them. That's one of the ways trampling from humans and off-road vehicles, that's one of the ways that dunes are destroyed all over the world. And here at Cardiff, ours are protected. So that's kind of cool. Well, we're so happy that you were here with us. I'm going to say my goodbye and thank you for joining us. And I'm going to ask Miss Elena to go ahead and give you her last thoughts. Yeah, we had um, one more way that in you are visiting down at the beach and you notice someone doing something that they shouldn't and you don't feel like talking to them because it's not your job, you can actually call this number or you can send a text message to the Cal tip to make a report if you see somebody who's doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And then we wanted to remind you and thank you for joining us today and go back to the ports programs. You all know how to get there because uh, you obviously sign up for this program, but they have all kinds of different programs. Every day there's something new. So go and sign up for program. And if you want to check out Nature Collective, it has a couple of uh, virtual animal encounters coming up uh, in April and May. So you can also join us for some other virtual events. And thanks for having me today, Sandy. And thanks everyone for joining in. Oh, absolutely. And Miss Elena, we want to just hope to see them another day. And again, go to ports.ca, or excuse me, ports dash ca dot us to find other programs that we offer right here both at cardiff and at san alejo as well all right and all over the state of california all right bye everybody